Well, I guess welcome all. I'm, uh, I'm Mark Seeger with HP Cloud Services, and uh, I'm a performance kind of guy, and I do a lot of performance monitoring and visualization and such, and I'd like to talk to you for the next hour, 45 minutes, whatever, about some of the things that I've been doing in our own HP environment for uh, Swift monitoring. And basically, I'd like to first start out and tell you what problem we're trying to solve, because I think that's often a good, a good starting point. Um, I'd like to talk to you a little bit about this um, open source tool I developed a number of years ago called Collectal, um, and uh, then jump in and start talking about what we're doing monitoring Swift and Glance environments, and also a little bit about what we're doing monitoring Nova environments. So that said, there's this interesting um, conflicting problem goals, statements, requirements, whatever you want to call them. At least I think they're conflicting. And it's also, it's also kind of a religious topic, the notion of uh, centralized monitor, centralized monitoring versus you know, node-centric monitoring. And the way I see it is if you want to do centralized monitoring, it's certainly, it's certainly a great idea. But the problem is, if you have thousands of uh, machines that you want to monitor and you want to collect a lot of data, you either, you know, it's one of these things, you know, you get a lot of machines, you get a lot of data, you collect it frequently, you know, now pick two, or maybe even only pick one because you just can't do it um, all at the same time. So you have these centralized monitor folks who want to be able to see what's going on in the entire environment. And at the same time, you have these other people who are interested in getting as much data as they can as frequently they can. And they're two very different problem statements. There's, there's no real intersection that I know of. So in reality, what you wind up having to do from a central monitoring perspective is you have to pick a subset of data that you want to monitor, pick a monitoring frequency that's not too uh, fast, and um, collect the subset. And then the dilemma is, if you're, a, um, if you're in the support organization, you're trying to support a situation where the system crashed or you're having some performance issues, now is the time that you want some really fine-grained data. You want to see what's happening every five seconds or every 10 seconds or every one second. But the centralized monitoring solution is only collecting data maybe every one minute or every two minutes. It may not be collecting the level of detail of data that you need to solve your problems. And this, this is what I think creates the conflicting problem statement. I mean, I'm, I would guess that there really is no single solution where you can take a tool, put it somewhere, and do both. But I would claim the solution's obvious. If you, need, if you have two separate types of requirements, you have two separate kinds of tools. You pick one that's going to run centrally, and it's going to monitor a small set of data every minute or two. And you take a, whole, a, a, a different tool, and you put it on all the individual nodes. You let it collect all its data as frequently as want, as much as it wants. But that kind of has problems in, in itself, because first of all, is the data going to cross-correlate? If you're collecting... If you're collecting all this data centrally, are the numbers that you're getting going to match the data that you're collecting locally? Because it's certainly possible that the two tools, oops, sorry about that. Ah. The two tools may actually be monitoring data differently, even though it claims to be monitoring it the same. For example, I've seen tools that have reported, system, that have reported CPU load. Some tools include the IO weight counter as part of the CPU load. Other tools don't. So if your centralized monitoring tool does report it and your local monitoring tool doesn't report it, you go to correlate the data, it doesn't match. That, that's just one example. But then the other thing is, well, what if you want to do some customizations and you want to collect some custom data centrally, so you modify your central tool to collect the, central, the data locally, but now your remote tools don't collect the data. And again, you have, a, you, you have kind of a mismatch. So what we've kind of done in HP, we've kind of chosen a hybrid model. And what that hybrid model says is you have a centralized monitoring tool and it collects a lot of the data centrally. And we have a second tool that monitors the data remotely. But the remote tool has the ability to feed the central tool with a subset of the data periodically. And as a result, at least 
when you want to add some custom data to collect in the uh, node level space, that data will correlate exactly with the data you're collecting centrally because they're both collecting the same data from the same source. Uh, it, that might make a little more sense as, as in the next slide or two. But the thing that's kind of interesting, and this is totally a, this is totally a coincidence, our centralized, monitoring, our centralized monitoring tool is called CollectD. That's with a D at the end. And our other monitoring tool is called Collectal with an L at the end. There's absolutely no relationship between the two of them, and they just happen to uh, share a lot of letters in common. So what I want to do is I want to talk to you just for a couple of minutes about Collectal um, because that's what I do and um, also kind of give you an idea of the kind of information that we can get when it comes to fine grain data. So it has been around for probably a dozen years or more. It's an open source tool and it has its roots in HPC, that's high performance computing. So from the very beginning, Collectal had been designed to work on multi-thousand node clusters collecting data at a very low um, at a very low uh, overhead, so typically under a percent of a CPU, sometimes under a tenth of a percent of a CPU, depending on how you have it configured. And one of its features is it coordinates its samples across the entire cluster to the microsecond, or from Linux's perspective, as close as you can get to a microsecond, so that when you're trying to track down some kind of a cluster-wide event, if you look at the samples on one machine and you see something happened at 1103 in five seconds, you can find another node and then you'll see exactly what happened at 1103 in five seconds on that node as well. So that's, that's, that's really pretty important when you're trying to figure out what, what you know, cross, cross machine events. One of the features that Collectal has is it can actually generate data that you can immediately plot. Some tools will collect data and then you have to like write a little script to analyze the data and reformat it if you want to generate plots, whereas Collector you can do it automatically. You know, you'll see a little later where that really is a handy feature. The other thing it can do is it can actually collect data and send it over a socket to a remote monitoring station at the same time. So that's another feature that it has that can help, that can help address this kind of problem. And it also has a built-in API so that you can add, add features to it for whatever it is that you happen to be interested in that may, that may not cur currently be native to it. And again, we'll talk about that a little bit as well. And then there's a few utilities that you can use with Collectal to, to extend its capability beyond a single node. So real, real quick, I don't want to spend a lot of time on this, but Collectal has this notion of summary data and detailed data. And the thing that's important about this is summary data will talk about, say, CPU. So we're going to give you a summary of the CPU load, which means it's the um, average load across all your CPUs. You got to be careful, because if you're monitoring an eight-node CPU and it tells you that you have a 12% load, you might be fooled into thinking, oh, I'm only using 12% of my system, when in fact, one of your CPUs may be at 100% and you're actually blocking. So it's one of those things you got to be a little careful with. The other thing it'll do, it'll, it'll tell you your aggregate network bandwidth. So if you have two or three or four NICs, it'll add up all the bandwidth and report it as a single number. It'll do the same thing with disks. If you have multiple disks, it'll add up all the disk I.O. Report it as a single number. And well, on the surface, you might think that's kind of a dumb idea because I want to look at individual disks. I don't want to look at I don't want to look at just the total disks. Oftentimes, in many instances, it's a single device that's generating the load. So by looking at the totals without knowing which individual device you're interested in, you can get a relatively good idea of, of what's going on. But again, sometimes you want the individual, sometimes you don't. But the other, thing that, the other thing that this gives you, which I personally believe is pretty important, is if you look at that top display, we're actually looking at the CPU disk and network load in a single line. So that means when you're running this tool, you can literally look vertically down a column and see change. And to me, that's one of the most important things about monitoring, is you want to identify 
anomalies, abnormal behaviors, spikes, what have you. And when you're displaying data on multiple lines, where each line may represent a different, a different uh, type of device, it's really hard to spot change. And, and that's, the, that's the hallmark, I think, of collectal and what I call brief. And in brief mode, you get one line per sample. And that, that's the key to keep in the back of your mind. Verbose mode says, okay, I can't fit this all on one line, I'm not gonna try. So therefore, I'm gonna take a certain type of data and take the entire line to display it. So that's why in the top line, when you look at CPU load, all it tells you really is the total system load and the total user load. When you look down here to verbose mode, not only do you see the user load and the CPU load, you see how much time was spent in nice mode, you see how much time is being spent on processing system interrupts, um, and, and a, couple of other per, a, couple, a couple of other parameters for, for CPU. Similar things for disks, similar things for networks. So that's, that's kind of, at a real high level, an example of some of the collectible data. Detail mode simply says, okay, you want to see the individual CPUs or the individual disks, here they are. It's a lot harder to read. Um, you may not want to look at it in this particular format, but if you need it, it's there. All right, shift gears. Let's talk about Swift and Glance. Currently, there's really no good way to get, to get additional information from what I've seen about what's going on inside Swift or Glance. They do happen to write a transaction record in the API log every time someone does a get or a put or a delete, there's a little record written into this log. And it tells you what time the get occurred, the, the object size, how many milliseconds it took to do the transfer. So that's kind of a cool thing. So basically what happened was I wrote a little, I wrote a little script that runs as a daemon and it tails one of the log files. It, it tails the log file on the Swift node or the Glance node. And the reason I keep talking about Swift and Glance is since their log files are almost identical, it makes it real easy to do the same thing for both of them instead of just one. So it tails the log file, and what it does is it, it writes a rolling counter into a static file. So every second, it says, here's how many gets I did. Second later, here's how many gets I did, here's how many gets I did. And it's not, it's not one of these things where I've done so many gets since the last time you looked. It's a rolling counter. And this is the one thing that a lot of, a lot of surprisingly smart people who do monitoring stuff have not grasped the concept of a rolling counter. And the whole notion with a rolling counter says, as many people who want to read the counter can, they can read it any time they want, and then they can read it again whenever they want and just subtract the two and divide by the interval. It's really easy and it guarantees that, that you know, multiple people can read the counter at the same time. You never clear it. It just simply keeps incrementing forever. When it hits a maximum value, it goes back down to zero. So if you read one sample and you read the second sample and you get a negative number, you add two to the 32nd and now you got, now you, now you got the difference. So this little utility reads the logs, counts the gets, the puts, the deletes, et cetera, and it writes, them to this little, it writes them to this little file that looks like this, that's extremely ugly, that nobody would ever want to read, but it's in perfect format for a computer to read, for a program to read it and parse it and do what you want. So this gives you the ability to then take this data and visualize it, and the tool that I use to visualize it with is Collectal. So I wrote a little plugin that reads, the collect, that reads this file, generates counts of gets and puts at whatever interval you want and gives you the ability to display it like I showed you on that previous slide with this brief mode and this verbose mode and, and that sort of thing. And then there's this other capability that Collectal has that says I can, I can send data to a remote machine or I can even write it to another file at a different frequency than I'm collecting it. That's the key at a different frequency. So what we have going on here is Collectal is actually running once a second collecting this data and logging it and doing everything it has to do. And then every minute it says, oh yeah, collect D. Here's what happened in the last minute. So you wind up with kind of both scenarios. You're logging it locally once a second. You're logging it remotely once a minute. The people managing the environment centrally 
can take a look at this high level, this high level information, and if they see something weird happened at a certain time of day, they could go to the individual nodes and look at the fine grained data to see every second what was going on. So here's what you wind up seeing, and again, I don't know how well this displays toward the back of the room, but what we're kind of looking at here is that <clears throat> what you have in the very top display, we can see the CPU load, the network load, and the glance load or the, or the swift load, and we're actually able to see how many, uh, how many, um, how many uh, kilobytes, in, how many kilobytes of gets and puts per second there were, and how many operations there were, i.e. the total gets, puts, deletes, et cetera, and, the, and if there were any errors that occurred. The next level down is the verbose display, which as I said before, it gives you the ability to display more stuff and fill up the whole line. And now we're actually able to see how many gets, puts, deletes, posts, et cetera there were. This display down here, the one second from the bottom, that one's kind of cool because this can tell us of your, of your gets, how many of the gets, this is the uh, network bandwidth one. So this is actually, this is actually telling you um, how many of those objects were you able to transfer between zero and 10 megabytes a second, between 10 and 20 megabytes a second, between 20 and 30 megabytes a second. And you, can, you can get a feel for what kind of load Swift is putting on your network or a glance. And then the bottom display actually says of the object sizes, how many object sizes were between zero and uh, between zero and one megabyte, one megabyte and ten megabytes, uh, ten megabytes and a hundred megabytes, a hundred megabytes and a gigabyte. So actually, you can go back at some point in time and say, "Geez, if there was a problem at a certain point in time, what kind of transfers were in flight? Were these large objects, small objects? How much bandwidth were they using?" Okay, a little bit of a gear shift again. I want to talk about Nova. Same kind of scenario. I wrote a Collectal plugin that runs on the Nova server, so it's not running in the VM, it's running on the server. And this guy is looking at VMs. And the thing that's kind of interesting is if you look, if you look at the command line that started the VM, in the command line, it tells you the Nova instance ID, which is kind of neat. And it also tells you the MAC address of the virtual NIC. Well, given the MAC address of the virtual NIC, you can look in some of the um, system tables and figure out what its network name is, like VNet underscore 13 or 18 or what have you. And then you can go inside Collectal and say, Collectal, what's the bandwidth on this particular virtual network? And then in this little plugin I wrote, you can kind of put it all together. So what we're looking at, oh, stop that. So what we're doing, what we're looking at here is this is a machine that has five virtual machines running on it. And for each virtual machine, we can monitor the CPU load, the, um, this is, the, this, these two columns with the BCK, that kind of stands for Bach, which is our own, um, block storage that, that we can uh, allow um, VMs to mount. So you can monitor the block storage, you can monitor the, the local disk activity, you can monitor the network activity, and you can tack on to the end of this the instance ID, and then using like Nova Manage, you can then figure out who the user is that's associated with this, and it gives you a really nice view of what's going on on all the VMs on all your Nova, on all your Nova servers. And again, this data here, in our case, is being collected every five seconds, but we're also able to send it remotely up to Collect D so that it can display this information once a minute. So again, you get the coarse grain at the operations center, you get the fine grain on the individual nodes in case somebody needs to drill into that data some more. So that said, there's still a couple of missing pieces here. And basically what it is is I, I wrote some more software that kind of says, I still want to visualize some stuff centrally um, based on all the stuff that I'm collecting and all these glance nodes and, and Swift nodes. So let's use the cloud to monitor the cloud. 
And, and what I really mean by that is there's a bunch of calculations that you can do on the individual nodes and then remotely in parallel copy that data up centrally. And if you're only doing text and if you're not dealing with databases and stuff, th th this can be pretty fast. So, the, oh, and the other piece that I'm also doing is actually rendering some of this collectal data into plots in parallel on each of the machines. So what this all turns out to is when you pull it all back, you kind of wind up with this, what I'll call a crude but useful um, interface. And again, I apologize if people in the back are having a hard time seeing this, but basically if you look in that upper left hand box, what we're seeing is a summary by day. So the, the labels didn't, I, I left that off of here when I, when I made the slide. But we're basically looking at a week's worth of, um, of um, proxy operations. And you can see that we're doing on the order of some 20 million operations a day. And, if, and, e, and everything on this upper left-hand display is a hyperlink. So if you were to click on that link for like uh, the 167E, the E was an experiment of mine that said when I see errors, I'll put an E next to it. And of course, I forgot the number one rule of large, in, large environments. Everything's always going to be in an error state. So it doesn't really provide a whole lot of useful information. But if you click on that link, here's what you see. And what you see in this link is you get to see the 16 proxy servers that contributed to that number of, um, I guess that was uh, 10 million operations that day. And you can actually see over here the name of each machine, how many operations it did, how many gets there were, how many puts there were, how many deletes there were. And again, visually, you can start looking for some anomalies and things. And you know, for example, according to this on proxy three, there were six, that's six million gets on proxy three, and none of the other proxies did that many gets. You know, I don't know why, it just happened to happen that particular day. One of the other things that you can do with this display, each one of those node names is a hyperlink. Um, actually, I don't think, I think, not yet. We'll get to that one. Um, but if you back up here again, this display is actually a lot wider than would fit on the screen. So I broke it into two displays. So what's to the right of this display that you're looking at is a further breakdown of how many 401 errors there were, how many 402 errors there were, all the different error codes and how many different errors there were, as well as this is the get and put network bandwidth about how many objects were, um, not the bandwidth, the object sizes. So that first column that says get one is telling me how many objects were um, between 10 megabytes and 100 megabytes. And the get two is how many were between 10 megabytes and 100, 100 megabytes and a gigabyte, et cetera. If you were to then click on one of the, see the, all these error codes, if you click on one of the error codes, you can actually go into the error log and see the exact error messages that generated those error codes. So back to these node names up at the top that I said were hyperlinks. If you click on one of those node names, you then get this display that breaks out the gets, the puts, and deletes by hour. So now we can start drilling down a little deeper. And for example, looking at this display, you can see at 5 o'clock, at 5 o'clock, there were 404 posts. And all the other ones were single digits. Or, or barely single digits. So again, all, all interesting data that might be worth exploring in more detail. Okay, a little more of a gear shift. Um, I had mentioned some of these utilities that, that go with Collectal, and one of the utilities is this thing called call plot. So what I was saying before was every day or every night, call plot goes and generates a whole bunch of plots from the day before and uploads them all to the central server. And what that means is you can statically display these plots. And by statically displaying the plots, you can look at hundreds of plots all at the same time very, very quickly. If you have to render them when you want to display them, 
it gets a lot more expensive and a lot slower. So again, this little interface that I built, which is very crude, turns out that like this a AZ1 and a AZ1, 2, and 3 are our production servers. And then the rest of these, SysTest1, SysTest2, RNDA, these are all our test clusters. So you can pick which, which uh, type of data you want to look at and then say, I want to look at bot data, database data, glance data, Swift data, et cetera. And then you little click on that little lower left-hand button and it'll say, okay, you wanted to look at this data. What kind of plots do you want to look at? And it just has a whole bunch of different links to a whole bunch of different plots. And since, and since we've been talking about looking at Glance and Swift operation counters, which in this case are the gets, the puts, the deletes, et cetera, I highlighted those two as the kind of plots you could look at. And when you actually click on one of those buttons, up pop these plots. And they're very, very detailed. You really can't tell it from the display, but each plot has 86,000 data points on it because it's one a second for an entire day. And I guess PNG is a very impressive um, technology because each one of these images is only 10 kilobytes. I'm still not sure how they fit all, those, all, all them pixels into that one little image, but that's how I, I, I checked it multiple times, and they're really only 10 kilobytes. So these, these, these plots render very, very fast. So again, in the back, if you really can't see what's going on here, we've got a lot of different colors on the plots. And one color is the gets, and one color is the puts, and one color is the deletes. Um, that's the top three plots. But when you, when you um, bring up the web page, there's really like 16 or 20 plots on a single page, and you can very easily scroll up and down to compare what's going on. And the plot on the bottom is actually showing me my put uh, rates of objects greater than a megabyte, greater than 10 megabytes, greater than 100 megabytes. So if you could envision a plot that's showing this kind of data, as well as CPU load or network traffic or whatever, um, or disk load, you could, you could then start saying things like, you know, geez, here's this spike. You know, I can see this spike right before 16, 1600, and you know, that spike goes straight up through the top. And it's like, whatever happened, you know, someone did a get, no, I'm sorry, they did a put on a large object, and it probably crossed those three different servers, because I can see the three different spikes on those three different servers. OK, another little bit of a shift gear. Um, there's another tool that goes with this environment, and it's called Colmux. And Colmux stands for Collectal Multiplexer. And it has an interesting property. And the property that it has is it will allow you to run Collectal on multiple machines of your choosing. It'll take all the output from Collectal and display it in a single display, much like top, okay? But the big difference is, instead of looking at top processes, top processes you're looking at top anything. So anything that Collectal can report, you can display in this form, and you can sort it by any column of your choice. So in this particular case, Again, we're looking at Swift data, so we can actually look at the gets, the puts, the deletes across all the proxy servers sorted by any particular column, and, that'll, and that can help you identify proxies that may, be, that may be a little hotter than other proxies that are you know, getting more, more of their load than they should. Or you might identify proxy servers that are getting less of their load than they should. Or if this was a Swift object server, you could actually say, I want to look at the disks on these devices, and you can sort them by which disks have long, uh, long wait times or big I.O. queues or long service times. And again, you can look at them across dozens or even hundreds of nodes all at the same time. And by the way, this is part of you know, the collectal open source stuff. There's nothing, there's nothing cloud-specific 
except in this case, I'm showing you how it works with some of these plugins that I, that I wrote that, that work with Swift and Glance. And there's a second form that actually, see the, the good thing about the top guy is it lets you look at the top activity um, at any point, you know, every, every second when it refreshes. The biggest problem with a tool like top, whether anybody's really noticed this or not, when you run top, it'll tell you the top, the top process at this second, and then the next second it'll show you the top process, and it's like, wait a minute, was that the same process or a different process? Are the processes changing every second, or is it the same process always the top process? And you can't really tell because there's no history with top. It's always instantaneous. Well, the second form of call mux gives the ability to say, okay, I know I can't display everything historically, but I want to pick one or two or three data items, and I want to display those every second on every machine. So this display over here at the bottom is saying, I want to look at six machines and two elements. I want to look at gets and puts. And now, every second, it displays a new sample. So now, again, we're into that whole business about being able to spot anomalies with vertical columns. Every row represents a complete sample across all the machines that you're looking at. And again, in this case, we're only looking at six machines, so it's not particularly exciting. A few years ago, I was, uh, this was back when I was doing high-performance computing, I was at a customer of ours who, um, who had a 2,000 node cluster, and they had uh, four 40-inch monitors or 50-inch monitors. I mean, it was like mega wide. And when I saw that, I said, wow, I got to run Colmux on this. So I ran Colmux on it, and I was monitoring, I think it was 192 compute nodes. So I want to show you a picture of it. And I want to caution you, before I bring up the next screen, you're not going to be able to read it. But that's OK. I can't read it either. But what you can do, I hope, is shape recognition. Because it makes it really obvious, I think, what's going on. If you look at this display right here, without even being able to read stuff, you can see those guys on the left aren't doing anything. Well, they're all zeros. You know, the guys over on the right, you can see where it gets a little, a little lighter and a little, you can see a burst of a lot of CPU traffic. You can see, you know, this solid band where it says very busy. I don't know what the numbers are, but you can see they're all pretty busy. And then you can also see in the, in the right-hand side of the middle monitor, it's like, wow, things are really erratic here. I don't know what the hell's going on. But this is some of the kinds of stuff that you can do with Colmux and displaying things as a single line. Sometimes it'll help, you know, you get to see properties that you couldn't see before. So again, this kind of takes it all back to this whole notion, I think, I hope, of central monitoring versus local monitoring. Centralized monitoring, you really don't care about this type of data that often, unless there's a real problem. But having this data available locally can really provide a lot of insight into what it is you're trying to look at. So that's kind, of, that's kind of this dual schizophrenic model that we're using, at least with some of our data. So does anybody have any questions or? If, no, no, I, I do text. I mean, I mean numbers, <laughs> yeah. No, that's, that's, that's from the NIC. Um, if the, the one thing that, that may or may not be obvious uh, with, with node-level monitoring is almost everything is available in slash proc. If you've ever looked at slash proc, there's like a ton of data in there. So, they'll, so like if you, do, um, if you do, what is it, like if config, you'll, you'll see some high-level counters and other stuff. All that comes out of slash proc, and that's the same data the collectible is reading. Okay, good, thanks. 
Yeah, no, that's a good, yeah, that, that, yeah, heat maps is something I've only just scratched the surface on. One of my colleagues had done a lot of taking some collectal data and sticking them into heat maps, and you, uh, you see some very interesting patterns arise that you didn't normally see. Yes, sir? Is this on? Oh, I guess so. Um, this would be a good point, uh, time to point out that uh, Swift has StatsD metrics emission as well. Um, so uh, a lot of the similar data is available through that avenue as well. And where does that data come from? Um, it, assuming you configure the proxy servers to send it, mm -hmm. um, they're emitted as StatsD UDP packets. So you still, you're still responsible for running a StatsD server, so you can, there's a number of ways to deploy that. You can go with a central server. Uh, we do one per node, uh, and then aggregate uh, as a second step. How often does it send out the data? Um, I mean, it's configurable. Um, oh, well, sorry, the, the data is sent out real time, mm -hmm. the UDP packets, and then you configure your StatsD server to uh, sweep through and, and um, uh, yeah, ag aggregate and flush. So it, it's the uh, it's a collect, aggregate, flush cycle as opposed to rolling to roll encounters. But mm -hmm. uh, once the data gets into whatever uh, StatsD is upstreaming into, whether it's uh, graphite, um, which is sort of uh, oh okay. What, there, actually, there's also a collectal interface to Graphite, so you could send it to Collectal and have Collectal send it to Graphite. But I guess but, the only th I guess the only thought that comes to mind is with the whole UDP thing is if you're lot if you're if you're not listening, then you're going to miss something. Right, right. It does have that property, but anyway, it's uh, it's in the code base and okay. Ready for use. Okay, cool. So congratulations, it's it's wonderful work. I was wondering how much of it you're planning to contribute back to the community. Excuse me? I was wondering how much of what you've contributed, what you've created here, you're willing to put back into the community. Oh, I, I, if you were at one of my earlier talks, um, I'm, I'm, I'm looking into this. I'm hoping that I'm not going to have a, I'm, I'm hoping not to have a lot of issues trying to get things forward. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of the stuff that I showed you is already open source. Um, the one challenge I might have with the community, um, actually this is as good a time as any to ask it, I, I'll make a statement, then maybe I have to hide under the table. Um, it's all written in Perl. Um, <laughs> when, um, when I first started doing all this stuff, that, that, was the, the, that was the language my group used. So all of Collectal and all these plugins and all everything is all, is all based in Perl. And um, unfortunately, Collectal doesn't know how to talk to Python, so all the plugins have to be written in Perl as well. But depending on how amenable the community is to uh, non, you know, non Python stuff, it's it's not all that it's not all that complicated. But it's certainly something I would like to look into making available to the community. So Great. perhaps we can get there. Alrighty, thank you. Mm -hmm. Anybody else have anything? Okay. Well. I guess um, I'm not, I'm, I might be a couple minutes early here. Yeah, shame on me.